The idea behind this film is, can relatively budget interconnects compete with, or more than compete with, premium priced interconnects, like my £1,000 cord signature XLR tuned array interconnects on value for money stakes? Alternatively, do these cord cables work really well in my system for my tastes? to the extent that they represent value for money, and crucially, no matter the price. I've got to be honest and say that I bought these cord cables before I set this YouTube channel up and review project. And it was more of a consideration then of, do I get the sound that I want rather than matters of value for money or price? And I think a lot of audiophiles can probably empathize with that. One thing you have to do though is ask the question, what is value for money? Because value is to different people, different things. But I think within that lies common threads. For example, if you've got a stereo, say under 5,000 pounds, you're hardly likely to think that spending one or 2,000 pounds or dollars on cables is value for money. Conversely, if you've got a system that's $15,000 or 15,000 pounds, you might think differently. So I have three cables from AudioQuest, which are XLR cables, and they all have, or all use, copper conductors. They have cold welded plugs, so no solder is involved. These cables represent the lower end of the AudioQuest lineup. And starting at $154 or about £119, we have the Red River Interconnects, which is the base level XLR cable with traditional AudioQuest plugs. Then next up, we've got the Mackenzie at $240 or £169. And above that, you've got Yukon, which is £279 or $400. One thing I noticed is that these latter two cables have much thicker cables. They have much more involved shielding. And by the way, on packaging, if ever a company could take a leaf out how to do packaging properly, it's to look at the way that AudioQuest do it. You look at their cable products, you look at, say, the AudioQuest Dragonfly Cobalt. Lovely black packaging with lovely photographs and graphically drawn images make these products really stand out. The thing about hi-fi cables is that as you start spending more, sometimes they work better, other times not so. What works for one person doesn't work for another. It's also system dependent. Undeniably, cables do have diminishing returns. So when you reach a certain point, as you start spending more and more dollars or pounds, those dollars or pounds get a diminishing return, a diminishing level. Where this level actually is, is dependent upon you. It's dependent upon your ears, your system, the interaction of your components in your system. And I can't answer that for you. You've got to ask the question too, what is expensive? Because if you've got a hi-fi system in the hundreds of dollars, then spending hundreds of dollars on hi-fi cables is gonna be a lot. Conversely, if you've got a system in the thousands, then spending two or $300 on a hi-fi cable isn't gonna be much. In my system, I actually think these cables are good value for money considering the price of my hi-fi. And what you have to bear in mind too with cables is that they're a finishing off accessory. They're to tune the hi-fi, they're to get the final goodness out of the hi-fi, to allow the hi-fi to perform. And on my point about what is expensive to one person isn't expensive to another, that would apply to, say, a really expensive performance car where spending two or three thousand pounds on wheels isn't a lot. 
Conversely, if you've got a really cheap car, then it would be a lot. Also, nobody knows how multi-thousand pound cables perform on 20 to 30,000 pound plus speakers if you don't own such speakers, as I don't. Which, incidentally, is a reason, if I'm being really honest, why I can't test such cables, because I don't have the gear to do it justice. And this isn't necessarily a big problem for me, because I'm not into a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand pound plus hi-fi at the moment. Personally, I think the benchmark for the value quotient of spending on hi-fi cables, even in DACs around say two to five thousand pounds or amps two to five thousand pounds, is actually much higher than people think. So in other words, you've got to spend a lot more and have a much more improved system to notice much bigger differences between hi-fi cables. In other words, too, that the differences on even quite expensive hi-fi up to, say, maybe 10, 20,000 pounds for using different types of cables can still be quite nuanced and subtle. When you start testing all these cables a lot, you realise that they are closer, most of them, than, than you actually think, especially interconnects um, maybe not quite so much with speaker cables, but with interconnects or digital cables, you, you find this. What I'm saying then is that you get good performance and value out of value cables or value for money cables. When you get people over egging hi-fi cables, expensive hi-fi cables, thousand dollar plus cables on modest, relatively modest hi-fi systems, Take that very cautiously. I'm not talking about £100,000 type systems, but revving up a $1,000 speaker cable on maybe a three or £4,000 system. Take it very cautiously because we are talking the small differences here. We're talking nuanced differences between these cables and they're not going to transform the performance of the system at that type of price with that type of system. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through every single sound quality difference between these cables. They might sound different in your system, but what you certainly find is they go up in performance as you go from the base model, Red River, to the Yukon. Taking the Yukon cable against the chord signature tuned array though, I did find the chord slightly more fat with bass and slightly bigger sound stage but the Yukon is slightly more nuanced and clear in the mid-range and but without that bass fatness and the differences were very very slight I've got to be honest. One of the things I like to do in determining the value of hi-fi is what I call the forget test so if you can forget the differences in sonic qualities by removing a component. They may be different and sound better when you do comparative tests, but you can forget those differences as you get used to the inverted commas least good cable. Then I think you've answered your own question over whether out of those two cables, which one is value for money for you? So a question I've asked myself in this review is, do I really need a £1,000 set of cord signature XLR cables? Put it this way, would I have bought the cord if at the time I bought it, I'd considered comparative value for money in my judgment about whether to buy either one? And against what these terrific AudioQuest cables do? Well, the answer to that is Well, I'm sorry not to tell you and not answer the original question because it's not just about my view. I found out in this test, but you will need to have to work it out for yourself on trialing these cables. The review does, however, prove the point that value or good value for money cables is where it's at in many systems. I think that's the best advice you can give someone about spending on hi-fi cables in most systems and it's credible advice too. 
spend a good amount on hi-fi cables, but don't go crazy with it because you get diminishing returns. So you don't want to spend tens of pounds or tens of dollars on very budget music type XLR cables like I have these Roland cables for connecting up musical equipment. But you want to spend a decent amount on a well-designed, well-shielded, good quality audio cable and it will do the job that you want of it. And ask yourself, does multi thousand pound hi-fi cables represent value for money for you? If it does, well, go for it. If it doesn't, you also know what to do. Once again, thank you very much for watching. Please continue to subscribe and like what I'm doing because it encourages manufacturers to help with products and it allows me to do more and more films.